Pleasure to be joined on the podcast by Shane Smith. Thank you so much for giving up your time and chatting with me today, Shane. Thanks, David. So I've been following your work on Twitter, where I'd say over the last six months you've been stimulating a lot of productive conversation in coaching philosophy, mainly around Gaelic games and especially around underage coaching. So for people that may not be familiar, you've a very varied background into sports science and coaching as a whole. So if you'd like to give people just an introduction of how you came to your current roles today. Yeah. Well, I've always had a love for sport, for playing sport, for playing a multitude of sports um, throughout school, primary and secondary. Um, but I never really excelled academically in school. I actually found it quite hard to focus and to to to, to sit for, for too long, you know. Mm. So I suppose I was looking at the Leaving Cert results yesterday, actually, it was 22 years ago. I got a, a very average Leaving Cert and um, wasn't enough to go on to college. Um, at 17 years of age, probably wasn't ready for college. So I failed leaving cert maths and I didn't get enough um, points to go to college or to do Irish. Essentially, I would have loved to be a teacher, but it just wasn't possible. So off I went actually and became an electrician. So off I went at 17 to um, enroll as an electrician, spent four, six, four years um, as an apprentice and then two years working on my tools. It was, I'd call it the university of life. As a 17 year old, if you go out to a building site and you soon learn to to grow up, you're working eight to six, you're leaving your house at seven, you're getting home at seven. And when I look back, it was a wonderful learning experience for me. And so much that I learned from working on building sites and with a variety of people I bring into my coaching and it developed me as, as a person and developed my personality. So that is now invaluable as I work as a teacher, as I work as a coach, having a personality to, to communicate with athletes, um, be it five-year-olds or be it 25-year-olds. So I, I worked for six years as an electrician and then I, um, my own club, Thomas Day, was offered me a job as a games promotion officer. If you remember, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk at the moment about Dublin's funding and how it's funding the success of the senior football team. Well, I was one of those coaches around 2004 who um, took a job as a GPO, um, which meant going into primary schools and promoting GAA and getting children to the club. and I just found myself so happy in that environment of working with children, coaching, and in a school setting. It was just wonderful. It was it was almost therapy, and I just found the place where I wanted to be. Fantastic. So what I'm getting from that is you're claiming the man responsible for building up Dublin GA to what they are today. You're the man responsible for the powerhouse that is Dublin <laughs> GA. I, I, I think I was, David, I was one of about 40 or 50 coaches <laughs> who were employed around that time. But like I spent four or five wonderful years working with children and, and schools. And I learned so much about um, the, my philosophy around coaching and, and building my own philosophy around coaching. And, and when I finished there, I was always interested in, in upskilling. And I always wanted to get, my, to get a degree. Mm. And, I, and when I left school, I never thought I was going to make that step towards getting a degree but around 2011 i um, i enrolled in a honors degree course in it tala in sports science and health um my little baby was only sophie was only three months old at the time so it was a it was a huge challenge for my, for my wife and myself to to, to to go for it but she was so supportive and uh, she knew i wanted to be a teacher but to be a teacher i needed a level eight degree so what degree was I going to choose? It was only going to be sports science and health because that's where my interests really, really were. So off I started in my in my degree at 31 years of age. Uh, definitely challenging in, in my first year I got through it with a lot of help from my wife and um, got through all the maths and the physics and the chemistry. Second year, our second baby Luke came along. So uh, also <laughs> brought its challenges. And uh, yeah, I went through college years. And when I got the third year in college, I decided to sit leaving set Irish. Mm. So it was a great opportunity to continue with my journey. I, I didn't want to waste time. So I sat leaving set Irish in my third year. It was very, very challenging, obviously, to go back and learn it, learn the language again. But I needed an honor, an honor in Irish to become a teacher. So I sat mm. leaving set Irish. And then in my fourth year in sports science, um, I remember really, really well handing in my thesis in May. And then from there, going to a maths grind because I was sitting leaving their maths in June. 
So again, a really challenging year, but got the leave at Irish in third year, got the leave at maths when I was in fourth year in college, and then the following September I began a master's with Hibernia, which allowed me to become a, a primary school teacher. So a wonderfully, a wonderfully difficult six years, mm -hmm. but <laughs> a wonderfully positive, enjoyable six years. And I think that varied approach or that kind of roundabout journey into coaching I think gives a valuable insight because I know within the industry we have a lot of guys now that come straight from second level into sports science into coaching and I think that lack of as you said university of life this life experience can sometimes be a hindrance when coaching yes there are huge technical elements but we have the personality side of things and actually being able to relate to our athletes and you work right across the spectrum from underage coaching right up to senior football coaching and management in the past. So do you think that enhanced life experiences help you better able to relate to any athletes you've worked with? Well, 100%. I mean, there's a question I always ask at the moment with, with children and, and even my own children and the children that I teach in school, are we losing the art of communication? eye to eye, face to face, because with so much technology right now and um, that children have available to them. I remember I got invited back to my old school, uh, old Bond Community School, to, to speak to the students. And the one thing I encouraged the sixth year students was to look somebody in the eye and engage in conversation, because those are the conversational skills that will be the difference between maybe staying in a job or getting a promotion or getting a job or not getting a job. So that ability to communicate with each other is invaluable. And I'd hate to think we're losing it, David. Yeah. And maybe we are to a small degree. There are many jobs now where you don't have to talk to anybody all day long. Which scares me a little bit. So the art of communication, and I learned that right through my my journey as an electrician on building sites, right through my ability to, to communicate with teachers in primary school, with principals in primary school, with children in primary school. And now as I, I'm so privileged now to coach my, my little boys under 16, my little girls under 18, the under 12 team in, in school that I teach in, and also Kilmacud Croak Seniors. So the wide variety of children or athletes that I coach gives me great, um, insight and it's the opportunity to to speak and communicate yeah and i think that that is invaluable as you said that ability to be able to communicate effectively because we even see it with the emergence technology within if we take a sports context we see people just spending their days in gps data spreadsheets that kind of thing and not actually talking to their athletes which can be often much more valuable data than what you obtain from any objective tests so Today, what I'd like to focus on, and it's been what you've kind of heavily promoted, and that is the coach needs of children and underage players. So it's something you've clearly been very passionate about and stimulated a lot of conversation across socials, Shane. So first of all, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, where did this passion for underage coaching or development of young and children in sport come from? Where did this passion come from? Um, I just I think I always loved um coaching coaching children. I think it's just so rewarding to coach children, not not to make them the next superstar, but to meet their needs and make training fun and enjoyable. Um, like I made plenty of mistakes that coaches made in terms of being too serious and and thinking winning was the most important. But we evolve over time, and sure, I'm on a twenty year coaching journey, and I've got plenty more years ahead of me and we're always learning and but I think it's important to remember why children play sport and I, I researched gender difference around physical activity and um, I did two theses in the area I'm sure we'll we'll get to chat about it but fundamentally why children play sport is to meet their friends to have fun and to play and when those things aren't there the children aren't there so as coaches, we've got a huge role to meet the needs of children in order to keep them physically active. Because I don't think our role is to find the next superstar. I think our role as coaches of children is to develop a lifelong love of sport where participation matters so much more than winning. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think I often I've come to that realization myself in the past few years and talking with different coaches that our priority in all underage should be just to get them to stay within the sport and foster an environment that keeps them in the sport because you're never going to find your superstar if they leave the sport at 10 or 12, 14 years of age. So just we keep them in the sport and the high performers will find themselves eventually through it. So that leads to the question is because when we think of youth sport, we can get very trapped into treating children like small adults, basically. And we see terms as long term athlete development coming in. How do we develop athletes and grow them through the sport? So for you, what are the priorities of coaching when it comes to youth and underage sport? Yeah. Well, going back to why children play sports fundamentally, let's take a primary school age. They play it to have fun and be with their friends. My little girl decided to join the under eight Camogie team there about six or eight months ago. And I brought her down and my friends were looking after the team. So they said, they knew I was into coaching. Will you give us a hand? So I was only too happy to, to help out. Um, at the time, there was three stations. There was um, a striking station. There was a shooting station and there was um, I think it was a roll lift or a jab lift station, which was wonderful. But when they asked me to get involved, I said, I said, can I add in a fun station? So we had about 15 or 16 girls and we had four girls each in each mm -hmm. station. But my station was very different to the stations. It was based on those, um, we were jumping, there was ladders, there was hurdles, there was pink skipping ropes, there was um, soft footballs, there was bean bags for throwing and playing. So the station I had was just was just play. Mm. So our numbers gradually began to increase over the last eight months because the girls are chatting in school and they're saying, this is, we play games up here, it's great fun. So mm. whilst the skills are important and they're developing the skills, this the fun station was the most enjoyable station. And when we finished back in the end of June for summer holidays, our numbers were 32 girls, so we doubled our numbers. Fantastic. Now, none of us had a magic wand, David. There was no there was no magical coaching and mythical coaching around what we did. We just had it in a fun station. And immediately, we're meeting the needs of children. And when we meet the needs of children, they want to come back. They want to meet their friends. So this one PlayStation and our philosophy doubled the numbers of children. And the happiness is massive. And the question I asked the girls before they left in the summer was, what's your favourite part of training? Mm. And to a girl, the answers were seeing my friends, playing with my friends, playing with skipping ropes, getting lollipops, yeah. having races. So they're, essentially their needs were being met and the numbers were doubled. So if we can implement that philosophy at that age, we are going to meet the needs of children. They're going to stay, they're going to enjoy it. And it's wonderfully, it's a wonderfully positive environment for children to be in and for a coach to be in. Yeah, I think I like what you're saying there as well, because a lot of people will have initial reservations and maybe an old school approach like, oh, well, we shouldn't just be babysitting them. It's not a crash. They're going to there to learn a skill. But as you said, they're still learning these skills. There's the stations where they're doing the skills. And even within the PlayStation, they're skipping, jumping, throwing, all the fun, what would be in a from a learning development, more development, the fundamental movement skills are still being um, practiced there in through a medium that leads to greater enjoyment and retention then of them within the sport. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the fundamental movement skills because they're something that I'm really passionate about. And what's killing children in sport is, is the word elitism. Like elitism is going to ruin sport. And there seems to be, in many cases, a race to excel. For example, when I was against promotion officer, I ran the nursery and it was five to eight years of age. So that was just like 20 stations. And you'd have all different fun games at a station. They'll be throwing and catching. They'll be skipping, as you said. They'll be jumping and falling. Now, it seems that I actually saw a nursery there a couple of months ago where there was, a, there was three year olds in the nursery with helmets that didn't fit them because they weren't designed for them. Mm. So at three years of age, the, the children aren't ready to be in an environment where they're being asked to go in a straight line, listen and respond, follow instructions share, develop empathy. They're, they haven't started school yet. At five years of age when they start school, that's a wonderful age that, to start sport because they develop all those understandings. 
before that, though, it's extremely difficult for the child. So we're rushing development. We're rushing. It's almost a race to get to the top. And if a child can solo with two feet at five years of age, I'm never overly impressed. Um, in fact, I'll often ask, has that child skipped fundamental movement patterns? And that's one of the main mistakes we see. Has that child been able to develop agility, balance, coordination, skipping, throwing, running, catching, falling, crawling, hopping mm. in one leg, all the fun movements that, because when we look forward, let's skip from five or six years of age to under 12 years of age, this action of the skip, David, it's really the high catch. Yeah. The action of the kick, it's balance around one foot. Rugby, being able to throw left or right, it's merely coordination. So agility balance coordination has such a knock-on effect to the overall athlete when they get older. I just feel we're skipping phases very, very young, and it's at the detriment of the child because they're not developing the overall um, attributes that they need to, to fundamentally have fun because the I can versus the I can't. If um, my wife is a really good skier, so, well, so she skis really well, and when we go skiing, she's good. I can't ski, so I really don't do it. Mm. And it's the same with children. If a child can show and catch in pairs, they laugh, they love it. It's I can. But if a child's asked to solo with right or left foot, six years of age, I, I can't do that, Daddy. Do you know what? Mm. I'm not going back there next week. And that's the dropout. And elitism starts at that age, unfortunately. And I think it, it is a problem that we see prevalent within underage sport in the moment. And I like what you say there about potentially by chasing elitism we're skipping foundational movements and movement patterns and as you said the children at such a young age aren't really suitable for that such highly structured activity because as you said empathy doesn't kick in till generally six or seven years of age to learn from another perspective within those children and because we go in such a structured way i feel that if we don't have unstructured free play where as you said they can skip run jump if it's unstructured, they're moving very multiplanar, they're moving in several different uncontrolled avenues, where if we get two structured straight lines, we often see as coaches that we have 12, 13, 14 year olds that when we try to kind of get them moving dynamically, we see injuries popping in and just can't move in certain planes of motion that it's essentially inexcusable that children shouldn't be able to move that way. So I think down the line, it could have some negative effects in terms of injury rate and that down line. So it's something I think is very important that you highlight it. And I suppose to come from the other avenue, that's the main priorities. And this could be, we could talk all night about this, but what are kind of the big mistakes you see people, apart from say chase and elitism, but what are the big mistakes coaches are making in underage sport? Fundamentally, making it too competitive. Mm. Once sport becomes competitive, it becomes exclusive. And if it becomes exclusive, we lose children. Um, and this is not always driven by the children, the competitive environment. It's often driven by a coach um, who may be trying to relive his or her own um, playing career, be that good or bad who may want their own particular child to be the next uh, Leinster player, Dublin player, Liverpool player. And like we all have ambitions for our children, but we need to go back and remember that children are not mini adults. Children are children. Their children develop differently, emotionally, physically, psychologically. But I think one thing that all children have in common is they love to play. And the term play, I've brought that into my coaching so much, whether I coach my, my the six-year-olds or, or senior footballers, I use the word play because my philosophy now over time is all based around play. Because as humans, it's fundamentally in us to play. My, my little baby, when he was three or four months there a few months ago, he looked up and he smiled. And that's the first sign of social play. It's that initial happiness. And only two weeks ago, we were away and his, his great granddad is 90 and his great granddad and himself were playing together. They were laughing. They were communicating. And that's still play. Now, it's somewhere along the line, David, we lose the ethos of play 
be it in sport, maybe a teenage years when we think it needs to get really, really serious, be it in adult football where, you know, we hear horror stories about coaches who don't allow laughter in the warm-up or, or chats in the warm-up, who think where it's, it should be a regimental approach. In, in the work-life balance, in some jobs, is it too serious? Do we, do we work eight to eight in many cases and not have time for play? We are, we are born to play, we are born to smile, we are born to move. And from a very young age to a very old age, we like to do that. Somewhere along the line, we lose it. But the word play is so important. And, and that philosophy of play, I, look, I coach that way. So, for example, I say to the six-year-old, will, will you play a game of chasing? It's just play. It's multi-directional movement. It's a, it's a replication of how a game is played, actually. It's a multi-directional movement. We play chasing. They're only six. They love it. Yeah. We go to the under, under eight Kamogi team. I say to the girls, will we play some shooting games? Will we play some catching or juggling games? It's still play. The under 12 children I coach in school, will, 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 we, will we play a penalty shootout? You know, it's still play. And right up to coaching the senior footballers, it's more intense with us with the chemical cross guys. They want to get value from the session. But when you strip it all back, David, we still play little games. Let's play 4v4. Let's play 5v4. Let's play a kicking game where we get six catches. It's still all play. Mm. So the word play is so important in the development of not just children, of humans. So play is wonderful. And within that, all it's... I would say within Gaelic football, it's a relatively novel approach or philosophy, unfortunately, within coaching. And when we try to do something outside the norm, something new, something novel, we inevitably get kickback and we get reservations. So have you had much barriers to overcome when you try to get away from maybe developing these athlete, young children as athletes or get shifting away from the competitive side of stuff? Have you had any reservations or barriers to overcome from parents? Maybe other managers is like, no, well, we need to get them the skills up if we're going to ever get them, or anything like that. Is there any barriers you've had to overcome with trying to implement these approaches? Yeah, absolutely, David. I mean, I'm not, I don't go and coach a team or, or deliver deliver a coaching course or deliver coach education workshops with the intention of brainwashing people. You know, I just try and give people the facts and the research and then what they do with that is entirely up to themselves. The research suggests that the element of play is very, very important. The element of fun is very, very important. And the element of friendship is very, very important. So those three aspects are the real reason why both children and adults play sport. There are people with a different philosophy around mm. what they think the children need. Um, and I think they are the people who are rushing the development trying to relive a career that was in the past. And I don't think it's a child-centered approach. In many cases, it's a coach-centered approach. Maybe the coach might, might see the coach might see a pathway for themselves, be that in rugby, go from club to province to international. And they think that success via medals is going to bring them along that journey. But I think the journey should be about developing the child and success is not the 1% of children that go on from your club and become an international or a provincial player. I believe success is the 99 other children who remain physically active in the club, continue their friendships, continue a bond with the club, continue to coach in the club, continue to be a, a chairperson, a secretary, um, and give back. I think the success story is the 99 are the 99 people as opposed to the one percent because we'll always get that one percent of athletes and they should be facilitated too. I mean, I'm under no illusions that sport is competitive and there is our expectations, uh, expectations for Kim who approached to win the championship and I'm the coach. I'm under no illusions as to that. But how you get there and what journey and philosophy you take. I believe should be consistent across all. One out of a hundred might go on and be professional, but there's 99 other wonderful children who could stay with the club and play a huge role. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when we coach, because by definition, to be an elite player, 
means you're in a very small minority, very small proportion of all players who begin a sport. And with communities such as the GA, but any sport at all, the sport as a whole is made up of average and below average players. And they're the ones that volunteer, run the clubs and keep the sport alive. And as you said, we need to facilitate those more so. But there is a stage when sport is competitive it is comes results orientated. So for you, what, at what stage in an athlete's development, at what age group do we, is it appropriate to transition, shifting the focus more towards winning and competitive outcomes? When we look at play and children, they're the experts. Mm. We're not the experts. They are the experts. And they come to a stage themselves where they realize if it's for them, if that competitive nature is for them, or maybe recreation sport is for them. When we look at the school system, the school system is a wonderful system and it's run and developed by educators who are highly educated. And if we go off the school system, for example, primary school and secondary school, in primary school, we get a lot of it's parental driven. The parents will bring children to the club, collect them, ensure they have the gear, ensure the lunch is packed, ensure the boots are ready. And then we go to secondary school and children become more independent, their own decision makers. And they decide, yeah, I like this. They almost take ownership of their own performance or uh, of their own decisions. So when we get to maybe 14 years of age, we see a massive change in, in numbers of children. For example, by 14, 50% of girls leave sport. And by age 14, about 30% of boys leave sport. Now we can ask, why is that? And it's complex. It could be physiological, biological, it could be emotional. There's a variety of reasons and we can't just pinpoint one reason. But one would be, are their needs being met in that sport has become too competitive. And if mom and dad are bringing them up to 11 or 12, the choice is not really there. They just go along with mom and dad. 13, 14, they realize, oh, I'm not really into this. That coach is too competitive. I don't like this aspect of only winning. It's not fun. And then they take it upon themselves to step away. And that's one reason. There are other reasons too. That is one reason why they might step back because Maybe it's simply just to, to just too competitive, and they take the choice to to walk away. And I think it's important that you highlight it there. We do see a higher proportion of female yeah. athletes, fem female youth athletes, leave sport participation, and we know that there's a huge push now to try increase female participation in sport and physical activity as a whole. And why do leave? As you said, it's multifaceted. We can't pin it down to one reason. But when it comes to coaching throughout the age grades and into adolescence, and this is area you've done research in now yourself, is there any gender specific considerations when we should have when trying to coach and encourage physical activity and sports participation between male and females? Yeah, well, all the research, and I did, I, I did two theses in the area, as I said, and previous research suggests that boys and girls exercise different methods of play. So obviously there are exceptions, of course, but mainly boys will veer towards more high octane contact sports, be it rugby, GA, soccer. That's traditionally what boys will veer towards at primary school level, and girls will veer towards more low impact exercises, be it basketball, dance, aerobics, tennis and um, the more non-contact sport hence why ladies football is non-contact or it should be non-contact so the reasoning around that would be girls and boys both play sports for the same reason to meet friends and have fun but they exercise different methods of play now as coaches my research concluded that we are simply not facilitating girls in a primary school setting to keep them physically active or not meeting their needs. If you look at a primary schools, I think it's 90% is run by the Catholic Church. 
um, funded by the Catholic Church. So there's a massive connection there with with um, Gaelic football traditionally down through the years. So if we know that not all girls enjoy Gaelic football, but the ethos in a lot of primary schools is GA football and camogie, is that meeting the needs of all children? Research suggests that it isn't. Maybe moving gearing towards more aerobics, dance, basketball. Now, obviously, there are exceptions there. And ladies football is on the increase. And I see it myself, my own little girl, it's wonderful how many more girls are playing. But that's essentially what the research tells us. If we don't meet the needs, they'll drop out of sport. Is there an argument to be made for the role of socialisation leading to this? And what I mean by that is we know that, as you said, research that girls tend to go towards more low impact and stay away from say Gaelic football as such. Is there a cultural element there where kind of guy, boys are encouraged to do this and girls are then encouraged? And because of that, the coaches within Gaelic football are more kind of, you know, competitive, uh, kind of encouraged, kind of more physical tackles, that kind of stuff. Would there be an argument to be made that if we change the coaching ethos within Gaelic football that we want to this competitive, more inclusive, more just let's not focus on physical contact as such, let's just focus on play that we would see kind of girls starting to tend towards more Gaelic football. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about meeting their needs and culturally maybe do anything as this match, match like, like I suppose this machoism element to it where like you got to be big and tough and strong. And I always say that we have this fascination in GAA. And I've had arguments with so many people about this and I've got a bit of stick on Twitter about this too. And um, my argument is that in GAA, we have this fascination on running and fitness and training. And recently strength and conditioning have become really buzzwords and they're important. But the fascination traditionally is on running, fitness and training. Whereas the fascination should be on replicating movement patterns in training, small-sided games, long-sided games, developing skill sets and developing the overall athlete. That's what the fascination should be on. And moving towards that in GAA will be slow. Mm. I'm not saying that many coaches aren't there yet. Lots of coaches aren't there yet. But even when, when I'm coaching chemical Crokes, we don't do a whole lot of running without mm. the ball, isolated running, because it's not a replication of game movement patterns. So I think we've got to look at movement patterns and replicate them in training, be that with boys or girls. So boys or girls, there's no reason why we can't train them the exact same way. There's no gender difference in training. The fundamental skills of catch, kick and shoot are always there. But just to encourage more children especially girls because they have a higher drop off to stay in sport we just need to meet their needs and as coaches a lot of us need to just calm down a bit and realize that we're not jim gavin or brian cody <laughs> or or joe schnitt we are just facilitators and that's all i see myself as a facilitator be it senior football or under five or under six all we are facilitators to facilitate the athletes, the children or adults to, to have fun, develop their skills, meet their friends and leave with a positive outlook on sport. Mm -hmm. I think that is an important message. And again, we could go down the strength and conditioning avenue. That's kind of my area. And again, I have the same arguments that we can cause the same physiological responses as high intensity sprints without the ball in these small sided games and we've researched the sport that and I think SNC it probably shooting myself in the foot here but SNC is overemphasized in a lot of Gaelic football in my opinion. Um the other thing that we see I personally see highly prevalent in underage sport and especially when we start to transition into this competitive mindset is sports competing with other sports and you know I mean we see GA clubs getting into the mindset, oh, we can't 
lose our players to the soccer club, to the rugby club, to whatever it may be. And then discouraging players at all ages, like, you know, if you want to be a Gaelic footballer, you should only play Gaelic. So in your opinion, is this wrong? Should we be encouraging children to play all sports and try whatever they want to do? We should be encouraging adults to play all sports as well. I <laughs> mean, early specialisation is, 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 in my opinion, is flawed. It's just flawed. I worked in a school setting in Australia, a primary school setting in Sydney, and the children were exposed to eight different sports right through primary school, swimming, rugby league, cricket, AFL, soccer, to name a few, tennis, basketball. I think the culture then was when they hit 13 and 14, they chose one. And they specialised in that area. So there was player profiling going on at that age and you were advised um, which area to to go towards. Um, I suppose long term, they were essentially thinking of like Olympic Games or professional athletes, which was, I suppose, understandable from their perspective. Specialisation, I'm not a fan of it so early. I think that what it does is it, it limits athletes, David. We're looking at burnout in a specific area, you take an athlete, be it a javelin thrower, for example, is he utilizing one set of muscle groups way too much at the detriment of other aspects of his development, of her development? I think we need a diversity in our players. You look at field sport. Um, if you play field, if you play field sport, GA rugby or, or soccer for, or hurling, for example, what we see there is a multitude of movement patterns that we can take from other sports. So if you play basketball, you're developing peripheral vision. If you play handball, you're developing spatial awareness. If you play soccer, recreationally five aside, you're developing head up and scanning and be able to see what's left and what's right. So once again, it's awareness. If you play badminton, you're developing quick feet. If you run, you're developing aerobic fitness. You know, if if you try other sports, it's so beneficial that just focusing on one sport and the 10,000 hour um, module that we, we, we heard about for so long, there's pros and cons to it. But I'd incorporate other sports with the children that I coach and with the adults that I coach. We play handball and basketball and bench ball, tag rugby, tag rugby, the greatest development of agility in a safe environment is tag rugby. We don't want big tackles, we want evasion. And I say to the lads, when you have the ball, if you, if you're, when you have the ball, you should be trying to avoid contact. So tag rugby allows us to develop that in training and uh, developing such great agility and such a great step. So I love incorporating a multitude of sports into training. It's very, very beneficial. Yeah, and I think that would be something I'd be in agreement with because we do see the benefits of other sports. As you said, skill sets you wouldn't necessarily think of. I I always go back to the example of wanting Irish rugby is constantly praised of is their ability on the high ball that is attributed to so many Irish rugby players having a GA background that allows them to have such a good kicking and catching game as well. So again, this is the thing that we should encourage a multitude of sports. And I suppose from a coaching perspective, if we are to shift our mindset that we just want children and adults just to stay in sport, if they start playing rugby and then down the line they choose rugby over GA, okay, technically it's a loss to our GA club, but it's a win for society as a whole. They've stayed in sport and they are going to be physically active for the hopefully rest of their lives because of that. I suppose, Shane, to kind of summarise what we've talked about, we've covered a lot so far. A lot of underage coaches I talk to personally and talk to quite a few quite often, they not necessarily coming from a sporting background themselves. They might have no coaching experience, but like that, they are just found themselves for one reason or another, helping out, trying to do their best in a club with an underage team. So I suppose, what are the key pieces of advice you'd give to underage coaches who don't have the same level of um, background knowledge and coaching, haven't done, say, formal qualifications, and are just simply volunteering and trying to do their best with their underage teams? Yep. And every parent or coach that comes in, comes in with the best of intentions. 
Mm. I believe that. 95% come with the best of intentions. I spoke to a wonderful lady from Galway recently and she told me that she looked after a Camogie team from under eight to minor. And I said to her, you must have some knowledge of coaching. And she said, no, I haven't a clue. <laughs> I said, and how did you keep them all together? Well, I didn't care about winning, she said. So we just played games and had fun and the girls developed their own skills during training. What a, what a, what a wonderful attitude. Yeah. So she had the same group of 20 girls from under eight up to minor. That's she kept them for 10 years. And isn't that success, David? Yeah. I, that's, that's success. And they still meet up and they think she's wonderful and they slag her now for not having a clue about Camogie and she still hasn't. <laughs> but their memories, and they've developed a lifelong love of participation, sport and friendship through this wonderful lady. So that's a positive story. Of course, we have some negative stories. And if we look at the types of coaches that we are, are we autocratic or democratic? Mm. The autocratic coach would be, would be bossy. They would make demands. They would punish. They would dominate. And maybe that was the philosophy that they were coached in in the 80s or the 90s. And they're bringing that now to the children. But children are a lot different now. And... Well, children never, I believe, sorry, responded to that sort of autocratic. So can we be more democratic? Can we can we guide? Can we give positive reinforcement? Can we foster responsibility as a collective for the team? Just like that lady did. She fostered a responsibility around, look, here's a ball between two or don't practice your skills, you know? And she was very much a democratic coach. So some of the mistakes we see, I would be the autocratic coach who wants to come back and implement that that philosophy, but it, it, it doesn't work. And I really, I had a wonderful teacher in primary school in, in school Melroon here in Tala. His name was Paul Corcoran. And he always, when I started coaching, he said to me, you know, kill them with kindness. Mm. Kill them with kindness and kill them with care. And... That, I brought that with me right through my, my, my coaching journey because I started coaching, I was in that particular school. And, and I think it's very, very important to reinforce all the positives and reinforce the compliment because when I'm delivering coaching course, I often say to a coach, the next time you're talking to your athletes, call them over, give them a compliment and watch them as they turn around and walk away. You know, whether they're six or whether they're 30, they're actually a little bit taller. They, mm. they, they jog off. They don't walk off. They jog off or they'll skip off if they're younger children. They kind of walk with a swagger. And that one compliment you've given them has risen them. And it's worth more than, than 20 training sessions or 20 skill sessions. And that goes back to our communication skills as coaches. Because as people, we respond to positive reinforcement and we respond to compliments and we respond to a positive environment and we'll come back to it. And also our, our questioning is so important. You know, the first question we ask children when they come home from sport is maybe, did you win? Yeah. Immediately, David, they think winning is the most important thing. But instead of saying, did you have fun? Did you meet new friends? And now winning doesn't become that important. Yeah. Because if we, they think, we think winning is the most important as their role models. They will think the same. So questioning is very, very important too. And that also goes back to communication skills. I think that that is a real valuable lesson. I think a lot of coaches can take away and apply. And I, even parents as such, I love that last bit about the very first question we ask. And I think anyone, whether you're a coach or a parent, or if a child comes from a sporting event like that, the very first thing we ask them in their mind frames the hierarchy of importance so we should yeah. be asking just did you have fun and then that cements okay that's the priority for them that should be the priority for me as my role model so i think that that is a really good answer shane and that brings us towards the end of the podcast we're going to start wrapping it up now and there is an absolute wealth of value there for people to take away and before i ask you the final question shane if people are looking to get in contact with you or follow your work where are the best places to find you yeah, they can contact me um, through Twitter is where I get an awful lot of messages, good and bad messages. Um, 
I get some some horror horror messages around coaching and um, around what what people think is acceptable for children. And I don't try and highlight them too much, but I the odd time I throw a, a tweet out there around some of the madness that we see, um, in the hope that we eliminate the madness. But I try and tweet about so many positive things, and people can contact me through um through Twitter. Yeah. Perfect. And your handle on Twitter is Shane. It's at Shane Smith one nine seven. That's perfect. And we can share that for the audience as well. So that brings us to the final question, Shane. And again, it doesn't have to be related to a sporting context. You can take whatever spin you want on this. And that is, what would you say is the biggest mistake you've made or the biggest learning experience you've had that has shaped the way you approach your career or your life as a whole? Um, I've made more mistakes than I care to remember. And mistakes are wonderful because Mistakes are learning. I coached in ways years ago where I emphasized winning. I coached in ways where I would put pressure on athletes or, or, or to, to perform and they had to perform. And when I look back now, I'm glad because it's just a learning curve and coaching is a journey. And we never, we never fully get it right. But as I progress through, I understand the value of play and how important the word play is. And play is stimulating, play is enjoyable. And whether that's bringing, bringing your children to the playground and watching them play, it's, it's one of the most beautiful things I ever do is bring my children to the playground and watch them play. And likewise, I was, we were coaching, we were coaching the senior football team, Crokes, last night, and watching those guys play is so enjoyable. It's therapy, I love it. And I love to see children and adults play in their own environment where they're very very happy mm. as coaches to children david i'd like i'd like to finish with this i like to think that we need to look beyond the sport and look at the child for example taking a holistic approach to training the one hour a week a child may have with you as a coach could be their finest hour of the week we never know the family circumstances. We never know the school day a child has had, and we never know what it's like at home in the home environment. But we've an unbelievable privilege as a coach to create, even for one hour a week, a lovely, warm, caring, loving environment for children to be safe and to learn in. And never underestimate your value as a coach to children. In life, we need just children need just one role model, and that could be us as that coach one hour a week. Because like nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Yeah, I think it's very important to have that philosophy with children and, and with adults too, particularly with children. That is an absolutely fantastic answer, Shane, and a great suitable end to a fantastic episode. So thank you so much for your time and your knowledge here today. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, David.